the War of 1812 and its connection to Florida, East Florida specifically. We've already talked about how the Jefferson era and Madison era were kind of obsessed with bringing the Floridas, both East and West Florida, into the United States. The United States purchased Louisiana in 1803. Thomas Jefferson and his administration believed West Florida was part of the purchase, Spanish West Florida. It was not part of the purchase, the Louisiana Purchase. So the United States went about making trouble in West Florida, which includes parts of modern Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, and Florida, everything west of the Apalachicola River, as I think we've talked about before. Or actually, at that point, Spain had moved the boundary to the Suwannee River. So everything west of the Suwannee River, between the Suwannee and Mississippi Rivers, uh, were part of West Florida. And of course, uh, eventually, the United States chipped away, fermented rebellion, and you had the areas between the Perdido River and the Mississippi River, River between 1810 and 1813 were annexed by the United States. So they are not part of Florida, the, the Florida that became part of the United States in 1819. The West Florida Rebellion is talked about a lot in American history, but a similar rebellion in East Florida, which was also initiated by the United States, has been lost to the obscurity of history. The Florida question had dominated proceedings in Congress from 1805 when the United States was haggling with France, who they would purchased Louisiana from, about West Florida, which had been retained by Spain, but the United States believed had been part of the transfer of Louisiana from Spain to France in the immediate proceeding of the Louisiana Purchase. Madison and his allies – the Democrats, the Republicans, whatever you want to call them, the non-federalists, were eager to take this Florida question out of the congressional discussion because a lot of Northerners, a lot of Federalists, some people who are anti-slavery were uh, concerned about the continued conversation and were not for the annexation of Florida. But significantly, as historian, one of the, the preeminent historians of our time, Gary Wills, tells us, on January 3rd, 1811, Madison sent a secret message to Congress asking for $100,000 to stir up a rebellion in East Florida to match that that was already taking place in West Florida. And by this time, part of West Florida had been annexed by the United States. So it could be annexed as well. Federalists, led by Timothy Pickering, oppose this. So this rebellion, this money that was sent by Madison and the fermenting of rebellion in East Florida is our topic today on the Florida History Podcast. It is a big, big event in the history of this state, but it's an event that somehow, again, has been lost to history. While there's lots of texts and conversation about the West Florida controversy and the West Florida Rebellion, that's generally acknowledged as a big event in American history and in American expansion, there was a similar situation in East Florida. And that is what we are going to talk about today. In early 1812, General George Matthews and Colonel John McKee were commissioned by President Madison as agents with secret instructions to try and acquire East Florida from Spain and bring this territory into the United States. The longstanding Spanish decree prior to giving up Florida to the British in 1763 that allowed runaway slaves. It was a, a decree in, from the 1690s that allowed runaway slaves to gain their freedom in Spanish Florida if they either served the crown or converted to Catholicism was rescinded uh, at the urging of President Thomas Jefferson, who did not want runaway slaves escaping to Florida. Now, they continued to escape to Florida, and instead of seeking sanctuary in St. Augustine under the Spanish crown, they joined up with the Seminoles, and hence the legend of the Black Seminoles. And we'll talk about that, obviously, in a different episode. Spain was now aligned with Britain, was fighting the Peninsula War against uh, France on the Iberian Peninsula in alliance with Britain. Obviously, the Battle of Trafalgar had taken place off the Spanish coast in 1805, where Admiral Horatio Nelson defeated Napoleon's fleet, lost his life in that battle, that famous battle. But Spain and Britain were now aligned. So this is a completely different situation than soil. We've talked about the War of Jenkins' Ear. We've talked about Queen Anne's War. Those pitted Britain 
holder of the 13 colonies against Spain, holder of Florida, or the American Revolutionary War, where the United States to the north was aligned with Spain against Britain, who owned East and West Florida. So for the first time, Britain and Spain are aligned, and the United States is potentially on the other side. So Madison wants to secure East Florida, just as uh, they were working to secure West Florida, or take West Florida by military force uh, before it fell ostensibly into British hands. But Madison instructed McKee and Matthews not to seize the territory try and negotiate. But instead, things went a completely different course. And and this may be part of a theme of history in general, where James Madison as president tended to pick the wrong people for the for, for, for big jobs. And uh, Madison is remembered fondly as a founding father, as a co-author of the Federalist Papers, as the father of the Constitution. My own contention from my reading of history, is that he was a very poor president of the United States. I think in terms of the first five presidents, all of whom were from that founding generation, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, and Monroe were all above average or really good presidents. I know Adams served one term, got defeated for re-election. I think history has judged him a little kinder than maybe he was judged at the time. He pushed back on the excesses of Hamilton. He also, in spite of the Alien and Sedition Acts, I think did some noble things in office. I think Madison was a very poor president, but we're not here to talk about presidential history. We're here to talk about Florida. So let's get back to that. In this case, the reason I bring it up is because I think Madison, again, appointed the wrong people for the job, something he did consistently during the War of 1812 also, the war that was to follow. So McKee bows out of the mission, and Matthews proceeds, moves into a house in St. Mary's, Georgia, which is right across the uh, the St. Mary's River from, uh, from Fernandina Beach, from Amelia Island. And what had happened in the previous decade or two was that there were so many settlers from the southern U.S. that went and took uh, land, were offered all sorts of incentives to to take land in Spain. And in fact, in St. Mary's, what Matthews found was that there were a lot of people on the Georgia side of the line who – felt like Spanish Florida was great, that they uh, were enjoying an economic boom thanks to uh, the markets um, that Spain had opened up. And and, uh, they were doing business with Fernandina and Amelia Island and St. Augustine further to the south, the capital of East Florida. And that Great Britain was doing a lot of trade there too. Florida remained under a certain degree of British influence even after Spain retook the colony to retook both East and West Florida in 1784. Uh, there's a, a constant theme of kind of um, British intrigue and, and uh, British opposition to the newly formed U.S. or creating pressure points and using Spain to do that in Florida. So this is one of them. So, so Britain's doing a wonderful job propping up Florida's economy at this point. Just think of it that way. And the United States is about to go to war with Britain. So think of it that way. that they're, they're propping up the economy of a territory that borders their enemy. There was a group of uh, congressmen in, 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 in the Congress, including the Speaker of the House, Henry Clay, one of the great figures in 19th century American political history, uh, who wanted war with Great Britain, and they got it a couple months later. So at this point, Madison knows he's going to war with Britain, probably going to war with Britain, and is trying to gain control of Florida. By what I said a little earlier, Madison did not want to seize possession of Florida by arms, but did want to have the presence of the military there so that Matthews could negotiate with the local Spanish authorities and then turn East Florida over to American authorities. So this is essentially kind of, yeah, I don't want you to seize the territory, but I do want you to seize the territory. Matthews takes that as a free license to try and seize the territory. Matthews decides, in spite of his instructions from Madison, that he's going to create a rebellion. He's going to basically start a war. And he was supported by plantation owners in Georgia who were uh, sick of their slaves running away to to Spanish Florida and being harbored by uh, the the Seminoles, as we talked about a little earlier. This is a constant theme in Florida history. If you go back and look at why uh, the War of Jenkins' year, the war, Queen Anne's War, why all these wars took place, it tended to be because of runaway slaves, or why the Florida fronts of those wars took place was because Spain harbored runaway slaves 
and then uh, the British colonies to the north had a resentment with that and had a problem with that and were trying to regain their runaway slaves. In fact, I think American history is written completely differently if St. Augustine is the focal point instead of Plymouth or Williamsburg or Jamestown. But uh, be that as it may, it continues to be a theme. It's a theme during the Revolutionary War, too, because Lord Dunmore, the governor, the royal governor of Virginia in 1775, offers slaves uh, freedom if they uh, run away from their masters, who were thought to be patriots, and hide behind the British lines, or you know, come behind the British lines, turn themselves into the governor directly, or in other cases, go to Florida, in, uh, British Florida, loyalist British East Florida, or loyalist British West Florida, British East Florida being, of course, more accessible with its capital in St. Augustine. So you had lots of uh, uh, African... African Americans in St. Augustine even during the British period. Now, during the Spanish period, St. Augustine was the most multicultural, most diverse, most cosmopolitan city in North America. Hands down. Something that's not often taught in American history. Anyway, back to 1812. So Matthews recruits this kind of ragtag band of uh, combination of militia in Georgia, plantation orders, and just other kind of elements. On March 14th, 1812, he assembles his group on the Florida side of the St. Mary's River, which is the border. I should have mentioned that's, and that's still the border between Florida and Georgia. So at the time, it's, it's an international border between the United States and Spanish East Florida, the Spanish province of East Florida. So there's a self-named uh, Patriots of Amelia Island. That's what this ragtag uh, group was called. We're going to seize the Spanish fort at Fernandina. And then Matthews had promised that there would be cover from the U.S. military and that he had full authority granted by President Madison to wrestle control of Florida, East Florida, for the United States. On March 16th, nine American gunboats under the command of Commodore Hugh Campbell lined up in the harbor at Fernandina with guns aimed at the town, and that was cover for this so-called Patriots of Amelia Island uh, volunteer force. General Matthews at this point demands the Spanish surrender. The Spanish commander acknowledges that there's a superior force and surrenders the port and the town. So on March 17th, the Americans are in possession of, uh, of uh, Amelia Island and of Ferdinandina Beach. In fact, in July of 1812, the Patriots would create a government and they would have a, uh, a, a legislature and a council and, and a court system and the Constitution, and they declare themselves the Republic of East Florida in July of 1812, in control of Amelia Island and Fernandina Beach at that point. But a lot was to happen between March and July. The Patriots had control of the town. They wait a day, they turn the town over to the United States, they lower their flag, they raise the American flag. Island in possession of Fernandina Beach, in possession of a territory which is legally part of the Spanish Empire, which is legally part of the Spanish province of East Florida. So you have United States military occupation on Amelia Island on s territory which is not part of the United States. Now it gets really interesting because the Patriots along with a regiment of regular army troops and that Georgian militia, those volunteers, moved towards St. Augustine, the capital of East Florida. They're marching south from Fernandina, from Amelia Island, to seize St. Augustine. So this is now an American invasion of East Florida, of Spanish East Florida. Let's call it what it is. That's what it is. The forces are on the outskirts of St. Augustine, 
when James Monroe, future president, secretary of state, finds out (laughs) about the American march on St. Augustine. He disavows it to the Spanish authorities, relieves General Matthews of his commission, and claims that nothing of the such had been instructed. Now, of course, Madison had been very vague in how he conveyed his instructions to to Matthews. And this is something that, again, I don't want to get too deep into presidential history here. There, there are plenty of good programs, books, uh, documentaries on PBS and the History Channel that get into the presidency of James Madison in the War of 1812. But Madison was very wishy-washy on some things, and he had, was a very bad judge of character in some cases. Now, Washington made mistakes, Adams made mistakes, Jefferson made mistakes, but none of them made quite the level of personnel mistakes that Madison did, in my opinion. So uh, I think Madison has created this whole situation. Monroe is trying to defuse it. Monroe orders the Patriot Army and U.S. regulars to stand down. So they stand down, they leave the St. Augustine area, but they are still in possession of Amelia Island and Fernandina Beach. And as I said earlier in July, they essentially create a a governmental framework. The next year they would declare a republic. But negotiations with Spain were slow. And in fact, the Patriot troops started plundering plantations along the St. John's River, started commissioning livestock for their own use, commissioning crops for their own use, and really created a uh, a, a state of anarchy in the area. They started plundering. Uh, they started destroying buildings and homes. Uh, they were, as I said, stealing laps, livestock or killing cattle and hogs so that people couldn't – the the general residents couldn't use them. Uh, they were uh, – uh, uh, stealing slaves uh, or, or, or abducting slaves or, or in other cases uh, trying to go recapture runaway slaves. There was all of this kind of anarchy going on and it continued until May of 1813. Amelia Island would be returned to Spain in May of 1813. The desire of the Jeffersonians at this point is, uh, led by Madison, is to have a republic where they can have yeoman farms and expand slavery. And in fact, um, as pictures showed earlier, there were countless plantations around the St. John's River that had been settled by Americans uh, in this period of time. So um, that's the bottom line is they wanted to expand slavery. And that's why there was this sort of um, expedition deep into the heart of East Florida. Next week, we're going to pick up, uh, start with 1814 and 1815 and what happened in that period in East Florida.